So today, I'm going to talk about what, what makes you woke inherently unique, like what it says on the side, slide. And I don't mean like your, you know, little quirks, like I like horses, nobody cares that you like horses. I'm talking about genetic stuff, stuff you can't help. You're unique, whether you like it or not, and that's too bad. So the first thing I want everybody to do is hold out their hand like that. Like you're, you know, Italian and you're very passionate about your linguine. And uh, then flex your wrist. And now look about in about uh, the middle of your wrist. Do you see a protrusion? Okay, now raise your hand if you see it. Like uh, this thing right here. Yeah. See if you notice that. All right, and so it's, uh, it's a lot of, that's, that's about like a little over half the class, I would say. Well, what that's called is your polymerase longus. And uh, functionally, it's useless. It doesn't do anything. Some people have it, some people don't. Uh, I, I think it's fair to postulate that, to go along with Anthony's speech from earlier, uh, at some point we need it because it's a tendon. What do tendons do? They connect muscles to bone. So I feel like uh, earlier in our evolutionary timeline, we probably had more muscles in our arms, and that's what it's for, and just, it, it ain't, hasn't been completely flipped it up yet. And uh, in a study with about 300 individuals, it was found that 9% have it on neither arm or bilaterally, and then 16% uh, have it on at least one arm or unilaterally. Now keep, keep in mind, like as we saw here, like that's a pretty small sample size, there's a pretty small sample size, it's over half here, but not everybody has this point of trying to make. And genetics is what we're trying to determine. And present overall in about 14% of the population. So what do we use it for? Well, tendon grafts pretty much. Its biggest use is being useful for if something else goes wrong. It's kind of a nice backup, like if you uh, tear a ligament in your knee, then just take some of your palmaris longus and put it there. The, it's about the most use it gets. Otherwise, it's just kind of cool to you know, look at and run your fingers across it. Uh, cilantro, I'm sure a couple of you have at least heard of this. Uh, some people like cilantro, some people don't, and it has actually been linked to your genetics. About 10% of the total population tastes like soap. How many of you like cilantro? How many of you think it tastes like soap? Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, it's about 5%, but what are you gonna do? Small sample size. And uh, like I, I first had it, like my mother made a guacamole, and I'm like, oh my God, why does this taste so good? And it's cause cilantro's in it. Adds a really nice flavor. And uh, one of the genes that's been linked to is an olfactory gene, or one that has to do with your sense of smell, and uh, which would be a uh, 0R6A2. And it's a receptor that, that is highly sensitive to aldehyde, aldehyde chemicals and aldehyde uh, the carbon base. It's the simple, most simple way of putting it. And uh, the smell of it is similar to that aldehyde and what are aldehyde is found in, well, insects, lotions, and soap. What do you know? Now, why do some people have it and some people don't? Well, just like me, it would give us an evolutionary advantage because of uh, Early on, you did not want to eat aldehydes. Aldehydes are bad. You don't want to eat the poisonous insects or whatever, whatever's the kind of stuff they put in lotions. I mean, by disliking cilantro, you're less likely to eat something that could harm you. And so that's why some people have it. And again, like now it's kind of made a little bit useless, so it's just not completely filtered out yet. And uh, now I'm going to show you this uh, something on a Nystagmus, and you'll see what that is. The video displays the voluntary nystagmus, the rare physical attribute of northern individuals. As soon as requested, the patient can jiggle her eyes at will. This kind of voluntary ocular oscillation develops on the horizontal plane. Now the reason why I know about this is because in elementary school I actually knew a kid that could do this. He had, he had the coolest eyes, man. He was just juggling back and forth. He had like a blue and green patterns without getting into something else completely different. And I mean, it was just a little bit And uh, about 8% of the population can do it. But again, that was based on a study with a fairly small sample size. Like, can any of you do it, for example? 
something. Yeah, to expect this is something that's a little bit less common. Since, I mean, I only knew about it from experience. And uh, of those surveys, about 79%, their relatives could also do it, which uh, shows that there's a strong correlation between that it has to do with genetics. Like, it's gonna be something different about you. And I don't care if you want it to be different about you, because that's just how it is. And uh, it'll be discovered at about the age of eight to 18. That, that makes sense, because that's when you start uh, getting better control of your body and everything. I got discovered around that age that I would uh, constrict my throat to where I could uh, screech at a really high pitch, but just flying around your body, pretty much. A blur surrounding, it's kind of obvious. Your eyes are oscillating back and forth. You're not going to be able to focus on any one point. So everything's going to appear blurry. And other names would be like ocular flutter or dancing or jiggling eyes. You know, fun stuff like that. There's more, but I mean, it's just funny, silly stuff. Dancing, giggles, that sort of thing. So it's probably unique in some way, whether if it was a, a gluten intolerance, she's not here anymore, or a, some sort of a mental case scenario, or whatever. There's something about you that's just different from everybody else, and that only a small population would possess. <laughs>